Well, thanks, everybody. Um, <clears throat> just a tiny bit about my background. I'm a philosopher, mostly but not entirely a philosopher of science, but as a philosopher, um, I'm a ma jack of many intellectual trades, maybe not a master of too many. Um, so, but what I'm trying to do in this talk is bring in a number of different, uh, connecting a number of different threads. Uh, we'll start off with this gentleman here, Dr. Samuel Johnson, on the heuristics of decision making. When a man knows he's to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Johnson seems to have been a rather unpleasant character in many ways, but every now and then he had some very insightful uh, comments. So as I go along, we'll see what this has to do with what I'm going to talk about. So we're talking about communication. The question is, what is to be communicated? And um, <clears throat> part of my claim, to, to the extent that decision-making is rational, predictions are more likely to be acted on than vague general warnings. Um, I mean, that's a large part of what we're talking about in this conference, is how do rational decisions get made about climate change, energy, etc. cetera. Um, the more specific and quantitative a prediction can be, the more likely it will be taken seriously by policymakers and the public. But this demands that scientists accept the intellectual risks and other kinds of risks, which we'll talk about, involved in making predictions. And um, in, in a large part of what I'm doing in this talk is really seconding something that Jim Hansen said in a paper published about five years ago, and when he talk, talked about what he called scientific reticence, uh, the, the extreme caution of some scientists in making, uh, especially predictions of extreme outcomes. So. Um, and I will argue we cannot afford the luxury of scientific reticence in certain cases. And at the very end, just to put a slightly more optimistic spin on it, I want to suggest that we can draw some guidance from how things are done in the so-called learned professions, medicine, medicine and engineering. So some guidance from professional ethics may be helpful. I'm going to illustrate my points with reference to the crucially important example of catastrophic ice sheet collapse because it's an incredibly important and fascinating thing, uh, but this is not really a, a lecture on glaciology. So, but still might be with the most important question of our time. We don't know for sure, but it, it's now possible to make reasonably act confident predictions of the gradual sea level rise that people can expect by, say, 2050 or 2100. Uh, those numbers are bad enough. However, much evidence, such as paleoclimate studies, shows that positive feedback mechanisms can sometimes lead to catastrophic collapse of ice sheets possibly leading to, to meter scale bursts of sea level rise. And Hansen and colleagues have shown that during the last deglaciation, there's some evidence that uh, the world briefly experienced periods of several meters per century sea level rise. Well, could that happen again? We don't know for sure. But if something like that happened, the Asian tsunami of 2004 would pale in comparison to, the, to a sudden collapse of a large part of, say, the Western Antarctic ice sheet. Um, a sudden meter scale sea, sea level rise would make everything else seem rather unimportant, except perhaps the Super Bowl. Okay, but the question is, can such events be predicted? And is it the chance of this happening 0.1%, 1%, 50%? I mean, uh, well, brief comments on the stability of, of Western Antarctic ice sheet. And again, I'm not a glaciologist, so I'm relying on on what I've been able to glean from reading and talking to people who do know a lot about these issues. Uh, current evidence suggests, though not conclusively, that Western Antarctica is especially vulnerable to rapid mass loss, especially if one or more major ice shells were to sort of do a Larsen B. Um, the, the, the metaphor that occurred to me, and I know this is not scientifically accurate, the sub-ice topography of Western Antarctica seems to resemble a giant glacial toboggan slide. Um, once it starts going, it might not stop. You know, obviously, I exaggerate and oversimplify. However, as Hansen has emphasized and others have emphasized, a catastrophic ice sheet collapse is a complex and highly nonlinear process, very, very difficult to analyze and model with precision. And, and I know there's been some very good work done in this area, but it's still a, a tough call. And as usual, of course, there just isn't enough funding. You know, haven't got enough data points haven't got enough observations because that costs money. So why even bother trying to predict such an event when you have such a good chance of being wrong? Okay. I'm going to make my own modest prediction. And I'm, heaven knows, I'm no glaciologist, but I will incautiously venture the following prediction. Um, even with unlimited funding, there is never going to be enough information to predict the next, ma next major ice sheet collapse with anything approaching scientific certainty unless you happen to catch it right 
on the verge. If you're just there a few weeks before it lets go, then you could probably say. Hence, any such prediction must be made under uncertainty. But such predictions, even though probabilistic, can be made. They can, you know, maybe large error bars, but they can be made. And I would argue they must be made. <clears throat> um, uncertain predictions are better than no predictions. It's just a very basic heuristic point. A weak signal is often the only warning we may have of an impending disaster. I'm taking this concept from a very nice book by Gernstein um, called Flirting with Disaster, Why Accidents Are Rarely Accidental. It's a really interesting book. Um, suppose you're on a beautiful tropical beach one sunny day and it seems to be lovely and suddenly you notice that the water is going out quite a bit and the fish are flopping on the sand. What do you do? You run like hell, right? Um, if the water recedes from a beach, run, don't wait for confirmation. You don't, don't want peer-reviewed study of what's going to happen. You just run, okay? So, so there's going to be situations like this. And maybe some of the uh, possible outcomes we're looking at could be of that character. Um, also, clearly, there's no basis for any kind of uh, risk-benefit analysis without, without numbers. You need possible outcomes. You need their probabilities and their likely impacts. And a more particular reason for... Um, thinking this way. In particular, it's generally going to be harder to get funding to research a non-specific and unquantified possibility. Funding decisions are also made partially on risk-benefit basis. Partially they're made on political considerations and things like that too, but uh, to the, again, to the extent that they're rational, um, you need numbers. So let's talk a bit about scientific reticence. Start with a comment from Jim Hansen. He said, scientific reticence hinders communication with the public about dangers of global warming. It is important that policymakers recognize the potential influence of this phenomenon. The present situation demands early warnings and forces the concerned scientists to abandon the comfort of waiting for incontrovertible confirmations. Okay, so now there's a more recent paper by Brees, Oreskes, and et al., 2012 sort of developing the, this concept of scientific re concern with scientific reticence further. Um, and they actually, I believe, did all kinds of, a lot of interviews, with, sort of a sociological study of interviews with, with uh, climate scientists. And they claim the available evidence suggests that scientists have, in fact, been conservative in their projections of the impacts of climate change. Um, they would prefer to, quote, err on the side of least drama. And another interesting situation that's parallel to this that fascinates me is um, um, in 2006, the distinguished theoretical physicist Lee Smolin published a really, really, really interesting book called The Trouble with Physics. And um, his major point, it, was, it involved partially a critique of string theory, which really upset a lot of string theorists. But, but um, the main point of it, Smolin argues controversially that, the conceptual imp that theoretical physics is in a conceptual impasse, that it's been that way for 30 or 40 years. Um, and this is partially due to excessive intellectual caution and a culture of risk aversion among physicists. And some, something rather similar, not exactly the same, but something rather similar. And, you know, maybe if physicists had been more innovative, we would now be flying around in zero emissions, quantum gravity powered jets and cars, and we wouldn't be having this conference. But, that's, well, that's just speculation. But let's get back to uh, our muttons here. Um, so there are good and bad reasons for scientific reticence. So, very good reason. In science, it is very hard to be right, very easy to be wrong. Science is hard, and it's so easy to make a mistake, and so any good scientist is very cautious and careful. Make sure you know what you're talking about before you try and publish. Um, you know, that's completely understandable. Um, perhaps not so good a reason, but it may play a role, stubborn pride. Now, there's a fascinating story of Carl Friedrich Gauss, the great 19th century German mathematician, whose personal motto was Pauka sed pura, uh, which loosely translated means few but ripe. And, and Gauss would, was, would never publish anything until he was absolutely certain that he had it nailed and there couldn't possibly be any conceivable objection to what he said. And as a result, he was scooped by many younger mathematicians because, I mean, he invented non-Euclidean geometry but wouldn't publish because he wasn't quite sure yet. And a couple of other bright young guys came along and beat him to the punch on that. So maybe you can be a little bit too this way. But again, with, with, with Gauss, it seems to have been partially like sort of anything I publish is perfect or I don't publish it. And that's, uh, well, if you're Gauss, maybe you can 
afford that. Um, a regrettable reason for reticence, of course, you might lose your funding or not get funding if you pursue unorthodox topics um, or extreme case scenarios. A very regrettable reason, and uh, you might become subject to personal attacks, and there's people in this room who've paid that price. Um, and then pr probably a bad reason too, and this is something that Bree said, I all have uh, tried to emphasize, there's a certain feel of fear of, apparently, um, fear of disapproval of colleagues, uh, almost more than the, in some cases than the fear of the disapproval of the public or you know, the, the, the blog trolls and people like that. It's sometimes some scientists seem to be more concerned about not looking stupid in front of their colleagues, and so they're extremely cautious. And then maybe, we're, so we're not getting the predictions that we need. Well, I want to suggest there's an ethical framework um, that gives you something to work with that, that might make it easier to, for scientists to, uh, to um, see a way around these, these sort of almost uh, philosophical impasses. Um, claim there are some possible outcomes, such as sea level rise, that are too important to be reticent about. Um, but scientists need an ethical framework that coheres with the scientific ethos. So the place to look, I would like to suggest, is follow the model of professional ethics, particularly in engineering and medical ethics. I used to actually teach engineering ethics some years ago. Absolutely fascinating from a philosophical point of view. And uh, we can't really get into it at too deep a level today. But, but um, what I'm suggesting is when it comes to possible outcomes that are both immediate and catastrophic, Perhaps scientists should think more like an emergency doctor than a medical researcher. And there's a place for both, but let's talk about how professional work, ethics works. And, and again, too complicated to cover today, but the, the three or four points we can put down is, to me are the, are the gist of professional ethics. And, and very, not exactly the same between medical and engineering ethics, but very similar. And of course, there are a number of other legally constituted professions about which you could say very similar things. So I'm not denigrating architecture, etc. But I just want to focus on these two. First of all, uh, for a real life pr practitioner, life and death decisions must be made in real time under conditions of uncertainty. Secondly, and this is particularly true in, in uh, engineering ethics in Canada, it's written right into the, the legal code of ethics, public welfare, especially in engineering ethics, is given the highest priority. Um, also, many codes of ethics, and I should just say, uh, I, I, I know this is true in Canada, I suspect something similar is true in the US, um, the so-called code of ethics for professional practitioners in, in Canada is actually part of the engineering acts. It's actually law. Uh, an engineer, to have the letters PNG after your name, you actually have to be ethical. It's required by law. Um, members of the learned professions uh, have a du legislated duty to report, i.e. To, to blow the whistle, which explicitly has been stated overrides duties to self, client, or any other vested interests. It is, furthermore, it is of the nature of engineering, and I think similar things could be said for medical practice as well, that it often requires innovation, but in a conservative way because experimentation is not allowed. When you're a scientist, if the mice all die, well, that's too bad for the mice, but you properly learn something and then you just go on to the next experiment. You can't do that uh, as an engineer. Experimentation is not allowed. You have to do something that no one has ever done before, but you have to get it right the first time. And clearly this would apply, for example, to the um, concept of geoengineering that a lot of people are discussing. If we ever decide to do that, um, this aspect of engineering ethics has to come in. We can't just experiment, right? There's also something called the precautionary principle. The professional practitioner must balance the imperative to do no harm, that famous phrase from the Hippocratic Oath, with the imperative to take action when it would be unconscionable not to. And Brees et al. point out that this is actually written into the Rio Declaration of 1992, and they, they quoted the following statement. This is a one way of stating the precautionary principle. Where there are threats or, or of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. So if you see the water going out, warn people. So 
I was called this on the front line, consider what an emergency room physician actually has to do. First of all, his or her training has a basis in the best science available. So they're not just guessing, they've had a great deal of training, and it's based on, a, you know, centuries of research. However, decisions have to be made very quickly. There is no room for experimentation or trial and error. Patients brought in in a life-threatening condition, they have to decide more or less immediately, what do you do? And sometimes they make a mistake, right? Just the decision has to be right. Sometimes they aren't, but, you know, they do pretty well. Um, professional decisions are often required in cases where, where there is no algorithm for decision or what people in mathematics call an effective procedure. Um, there, there's, there isn't something you can just plug into a formula and tell you whether or not you should do. I mean, there are formulas up in so, of, of many sorts, but very often a, the, what characterizes a professional decision, a professional judgment, is this characteristic, again, that you're, you're doing something that's not quite in the book. So such cases require judgment, which is an almost aesthetic ability to weigh the pros and cons of a problem and act decisively. And if we had more time, we could actually uh, trace this concept of judgment back actually to Aristotle, where uh, who sort of argued we should seek the golden mean, and that you, you often have to make these calls, and there isn't a set of... Well, for example, to a, a, an ancient Greek thinker such as Aristotle, uh, a code of ethics such as, let's say, the Ten Commandments would have seemed almost childish. I mean, it's just, yes, of course, it's very useful to have a list of pointers to remember, but in the end, you just have to make the right call, and that's what counts. Well, I'm very optimistic, or cautiously optimistic, that if we give reason the tools, and it will do the, it will do the job. So I joined Jim Hansen in arguing that faced with the risk of extreme outcomes such as ice sheet collapse, killer heat waves, oceanic anoxia. Nobody's talked about that yet at this conference. That's, that's a really interesting one. Uh, in, uh, bizarre sense of interesting. Oceanic anoxia, etc. Scientists must do their absolute best, even in the face of inadequate data, to make calls that can guide action in a positive direction. I'm cautiously optimistic that, as Dr. Johnson suggested, there is a greater chance of rational decisions being made if decision makers are provided with the most definitive predictions that science will allow. And of course, there may be uncertainties on those predictions. You can state that too, but you've still got to make the call and just sitting on your hands and say, oh, we don't have enough information yet. Not good enough in many cases. And you have to do that even if these predictions are one, unpleasant, and two, they cannot be made with certainty. And I'll just cl conclude one final point. And there's also a role for the stubborn Gaussian pride as well. The, um, and this is actually a, a case where, where stubborn pride and ethical obligation give the same answer. Here's where stubborn pride may play a positive role. If West Antarctica lets go one hot afternoon, scientists do not want to hear someone say, you never warned us.